Kia ora koutou, tēnei te mihi nui ki a koutou. Nga tararua, nga maunga, ko takitimu te waka, ko nga te kahanunu, me rangi tāne o ku iwi, ko nga te moe, te hapū, ko rua mahanga te awa, ko wairarapa te moana, ko papawai tōku marae, ko hoane rangi taki i waho tōku tipuna, ko mea ko mahau. Tēnā koutou katoa. Um... First and foremost, I'd actually like to, to start by um, thanking Margie for organising today. I think it's wonderful that we have these events that aim to inform and educate our community. And so I'd just like you all to put your hands together um, for her efforts here today. So kia ora, mate. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge um, Dr Mike Joy, who's here from Massey University, who has been at the forefront of, again, educating our community about what the issues are surrounding the Manawatu River, um, especially with regard to the pollution of. Um, and again, Mike, it's, it's good to see you here again today, um, giving it your best and sticking it up the bastards who pollute the Manawatu River. So kia ora, Mike. And thirdly, um, I'd like to thank you all for coming here today. Um, it shows that you care about what's happening with our river um, and that you are, <coughs> are aiming to get educated and informed about what the issues are surrounding the pollution um, rather than just reading about it in the standard. So good on you. So all give yourselves a round of applause too. There's a, a proverb from Whanganui that says, uh, ko au te awa, ko te awa ko au. And that is, uh, the river is me and I am the river. And I think that that perhaps is the most appropriate proverb that encapsulates uh, the relationship between Māori and rivers throughout the country. Uh, and so for the Manawa too, um, it's no different for the people of Rangitāne. Um, for myself, I come from the Wairarapa, and my river over there is uh, the Rua Mahanga. And so if the Rua Mahanga is polluted and not doing so well, um, and in actual fact it is, it is in that state, then we as a people suffer as a result. And so the relationship is based on um, mutual mutuality and reciprocity. And so when I hear kaitiakitanga, those are the concepts and the values that I, I think about. Not so much guardianship, which I know is a, a word that's been bandied around to describe kaitiaki, um, because for me, guardianship uh, is sort of uh, about a, a bit of a power imbalance. And so I like to think of us as, as equal beings, and that if one is out of kilter, then the other one is also. Um, and so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what I've written in, in a chapter for an upcoming book that Margie has mentioned called uh, Kaitiaki, Māori and the Environment. It should be out in all good bookstores, I think, come uh, late next month. And the title of my chapter was called uh, The Death of the River, a case study of the Manawatu River. And so to begin with, I started looking at who has an interest in terms of iwi. And there are four. There's Ngāta Kahununu, <coughs> which has an interest because the river starts on the other side of the ranges. And then as we hit Dannyberg and along through here, of course we have Rangitani. And then in the lower reaches, we have Ngāti Raukawa down Shannon Foxton Way. And also Muopoko has an interest because their kaimoana beds are there along the beaches for which the, the river comes out from, out to. Uh, the river was formed by a massive totara tree from the Pukitoi range in Hawke's Bay. And it was under the spell of Okatia. And so legend has it that that is how the river was formed. And this massive totara tree worked its way <clears throat> from over the other side of the ranges out to Foxton. The naming of the river comes from a man, a famed Māori uh, explorer called Ho. And he came across the river when he was looking for his wife who had done the dirty on him. And he said, this river is so deep, so wide and so cold that it made his breath stand still. So that's what Manawatu River means, or Manawatu, my breath stands still. In 1855, 
there were 3,400 Māori who resided along the banks of the Manawatū River. And they depended upon that river for their water, <coughs> for bathing, and for kai, uh, predominantly eels. And so the river was very heavily populated at that time. And then throughout the course of time up to present day, those settlements um, have gradually dwindled in size, and these days I don't think there's anyone right on the banks of the Manawatū River. And that has also reflected um, the pollution of, of the river. The pollution of the river really first began in 1890 on a, on a large scale when Palmerston North Town started putting their sewage into the river. It was untreated in those days. In 1957, a report was done by the Health and Marine Department which was talking about the polluted sewage, waste disposal, rubbish, the meat waste, the wool scour that was going into the river. And at that time, people were noticing that a green algae was forming and that a sewage fungus was forming as well. And it was attributed to faecal matter or poos. <clears throat> so what the report recommended was that people would be banned from swimming from the Oroa River and also from Foxton. The Palmerston North City Council, who was primarily responsible for the river at that time, dismissed the report, said it was rubbish, and continued on their merry way polluting the river. Then 20 years later, in 1977, the Manawatu Catchment Board, who at that time was responsible for the river, um, also did a report, and they said it was very badly polluted, that the oxygen in the river was too low. They also reported that <coughs> the, the, the safe standard of faecal coliforms per 100 ml of water should be 200. It was recorded at the time to be anywhere between 33,000 and 700,000 faecal coliforms per 100 ml of water. So it was extremely polluted at the time. And what you saw around that time, and some of the older folks here probably can remember, were the fish kills uh, in 1978 in 1984, which comes about as a result of the lack of oxygen, and so the fish would die and they would float up the top. One report read, one trout was observed in a morbid state exhibiting the following symptoms. Head directed to riverbed, difficulties in maintaining depth by floating to the surface, <coughs> tail first, appeared to have spinal spasms, the fish appeared to alternate between periods of lethargy and violent activity. When the trout finally died, its mouth and opuncula were gaping and mud had collected in its mouth from its moribund activity. And so that's a very vivid description for me about what was happening to life in the river at that time. <coughs> 